everybody. My name is Oliver Sumping, and I'm a sleep physician. Um, I see a lot of patients uh, who are sleepy, and I also see a lot of patients who have long COVID. And so I'm happy to spend a few minutes to talk to you all about uh, some sleep issues in long COVID, particularly uh, very sleepy patients. So one of the more common complaints for people who have long COVID is uh, would be sleep issues, and that can take a lot of different forms. Uh, my colleague, Nora Simpson, is going to be talking about insomnia, which is maybe one of the most common forms of sleep problems in long COVID, but I'm going to be talking about sort of, in some ways, the other end of the spectrum, so hypersomnolence. So when we talk about hypersomnolence, I think it helps to start by thinking about what that means. Hypersomnolence is something that I think we kind of, on the one hand, have a pretty intuitive concept of what it is. Uh, we've all experienced sleepiness before. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of a bit of a slippery concept. Uh, and, and I think it is because it's kind of multidimensional. So broadly speaking, I would say that hypersomnolence represents kind of some kind of imbalance between sleep and wake drives, specifically where the drive towards sleep is stronger uh, comparatively relative to the uh, uh, wake drive. But this can manifest in a number of different ways. Uh, so for some people, that can just mean an excessive need to sleep. So these are patients who might need to sleep 11 hours, 12 hours, maybe more uh, each night. They might otherwise do pretty okay, but they just really need a lot of sleep at night. Uh, some other patients might have what we call sleep inertia. So essentially kind of difficulty waking up, uh, whether that's in the morning or maybe after a nap and it just takes them a while, sometimes hours to really kind of get going and feel like they've woken up. Uh, some patients might feel like they're in a constant state of like hypoarousal so that like they kind of never feel completely awake. They're never really alert. They always kind of feel like they're kind of a little bit uh, sleeping almost during the day. And then there's excessive sleepiness, which is kind of a, a broad way of saying it, but in the very narrow specific sense that I mean it for the slide at least, uh, what I mean is uh, just people who have difficulty staying awake. So people who are more likely to doze off, um, especially if they're not stimulated. So this can be sometimes at inopportune times, maybe when they're driving, maybe uh, during a meeting, maybe during a class, maybe during a long COVID webinar, um, all kinds of situations where uh, they people might have difficulty staying awake. So I do wanna make a, a special mention of the distinction between sleepiness and fatigue. And this is something that kind of comes up a lot. So, you know, I'm, talking about sleepiness in a very kind of specific sense, but people use sleepiness and fatigue and other similar terms like tired, uh, often kind of interchangeably. And so, you know, sleepiness is what I was just kind of mentioning on the previous slide, but fatigue is more of a kind of lack of energy, sort of low energy state, maybe accompanied by uh, low motivation. And this is, you know, something that might overlap with sleepiness for some patients, but a lot of times happens on its own. So a lot of patients, they'll, you know, again, they can have both, but a lot of times there's one that uh, is present more than the other, or maybe just one uh, of them uh, exclusively. So when it comes to long COVID, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of different sleep complaints that people can have in the context of long COVID. Um, these are some numbers uh, from just uh, our clinic that uh, we've collected. It's unpublished, just kind of a small uh, group. Um, so, you know, I don't know, I, I would draw too many conclusions just from this, but it, it kind of shows you the general sense of what we see as far as sleep complaints in this population. So insomnia is pretty pop, is pretty common, um, but then excessive daytime sleepiness is not, not far behind. It's a pretty common complaint as well. So I think it's important to think about you know, when you have a patient who's sleepy, you know, of course, think about why they're sleepy, what the possible cause might be, uh, or just kind of the context that that sleepiness is occurring in. So there are a lot of different considerations here. Uh, at the top of this list is medical disorders. Um, so this includes long COVID, um, but it can uh, be other things too. Uh, so sometimes maybe endocrine disorders, like somebody who's hypothyroid uh, or uh, neurologic disorders, uh, specific examples might be myotonic dystrophy or Parkinson's disease. These are patients who are very often uh, quite sleepy. Um, but beyond kind of the medical and neurologic disorders, you have psychiatric disorders. A lot of times we'll have patients with comorbid 
depression or anxiety, kind of these mood disorders often go along with sleepiness. Of course, sleepiness can be caused by medications or sometimes kind of other substances that patients might take. So that's something to kind of think about. One of the most straightforward and simplest uh, reasons why people might be sleepy is just simply not, not sleeping enough. Um, but then it gets to uh, you know, sleep disorders. So people who have problems like something that's happening with their sleep at night, uh, sleep apnea would be the classic example of that. Uh, and that can lead to sleepiness during the day. And then you can also have disorders of hypersomnolence where sleepiness is really kind of the, the, core, the core of the disorder. So something like narcolepsy or what we call idiopathic hypersomnia would fall under this category as well. So the reason that I kind of break this down into these different categories um, is because I think it helps to sort of guide where these patients can be managed. So patients who have medical disorders, psychiatric disorders, or sort of sleepiness from medications or substances, those are issues that generally speaking can be managed outside of a sleep clinic. Somebody with a specific sleep disorder, uh, including disorders of hypersomnolence, that's usually something that's better managed inside of a sleep clinic. Uh, I put insufficient sleep as kind of an overlap area because like it doesn't take special sleep expertise to advise someone to sleep more, but at the same time, sometimes that's trickier than you might think to really uh, tease out. Like it sometimes takes a detailed sleep history, which uh, can be difficult to obtain sometimes in the context of a busy uh, appointment where maybe a patient has 10 other problems on their list and you have 15 minutes to talk to them about all of these things. Uh, so sometimes uh, it, it doesn't get uncovered until, until they have a sleep evaluation. So when you have a patient who comes to you reporting excessive sleepiness, um, you know, before we even get to the content on the slide, I think the, the first thing that I'd be thinking about is what do they mean by that? So like I was mentioning in the first few slides of this talk, sleepiness, is a term that's used pretty broadly and can mean different things to different people. So really trying to pin down what a patient means when they say that they're sleepy, or for that matter, if they come to you complaining of uh, fatigue or, or something else, kind of understanding what they mean by that, I think is a good first step. But assuming that they are talking about sleepiness in the same way that, that I'm talking about sleepiness right now, I think a good first step to the extent that you can is to try to understand their sleep schedule. So this is something that can tell you a bit about the duration of their sleep and the regularity of their sleep. There are different ways that you can assess this. You can start by just kind of asking them, asking them about their bedtime, asking them when they get up. Um, but something to sort of take it a step further that oftentimes can help is to do what's called a sleep diary. So you can see on the right here, uh, an example of, of a sleep diary. And it's basically just kind of somebody tracking their sleep in some way, kind of filling out a form to try to get a, a sense of their sleep from night to night. And where this can be helpful is you can kind of better uh, understand the night to night variability of somebody's sleep as well as maybe trends. And that's something that can be more difficult to pick up if you're just kind of asking, you know, when do you usually go to bed? Um, I make a special mention here of sleep apnea because it's just so common. And so there's different ways that you can try to kind of do a basic screen or assessment for this. Uh, you can uh, ask about specific symptoms or, or evaluate specific risk factors, things like snoring, uh, obesity, uh, somebody with obvious upper airway abnormalities, like really big tonsils as an example. So those might be things that might raise a flag to make you think about sleep apnea a little bit more. Uh, there are other ways of uh, specific screening tools that have been developed to uh, screen for sleep apnea. So the stop bang uh, questionnaire being uh, one of the more, more common ones. And I would say if you, you do encounter someone where they, they kind of screen positive or you have some suspicion for sleep apnea, I'd have a very low threshold for referring those patients straight to the sleep clinic. And just to kind of delve into this a little bit further, this is what the stop bang questionnaire looks like. Many of you might have seen this before. I do note uh, in the lower right of the slide here, you can see where you can actually request permission to use this. Uh, so that is something that you're supposed to do for using the stop bang. I'm not going to go through this line by line, but just to kind of give you a, a visual uh, for those of you who haven't seen it. Again, a common screening tool. There are other ones like Berlin questionnaire would be an example, but uh, things that you might consider using for sleepy patients. But other things that you, of course, want to do if you have a patient who's sleepy, you want to check to see if there might be anything else going on, some other disorder, neurologic disorder. Uh, you know, are they uh, weak 
somewhere? Do they have some kind of focal weakness? Uh, do they have like a resting tremor that might indicate Parkinson's disease or something like that? Um, you want to, of course, review the medications that they're on carefully and beyond the prescribed medications, anything else that they might be taking or using that could be a reason for their sleepiness. And then you might want to do some labs too. And this is something that, of course, you want to uh, use your clinical judgment for to kind of think about what you test for. But uh, some considerations might be some basics like a BMP, uh, maybe a CBC, a TSH. Uh, in some cases, maybe your vitamin D levels might make sense to check as well. Now, shifting from evaluation to management, I think some basics would be, first of all, if we're talking about sleepy patients with long COVID, um, then generally managing their long COVID makes sense. Uh, and that's something that my colleagues are going over in much more detail than I am. But, you know, things like maybe low dose naltrexone, or maybe if they have other symptoms, other specific symptoms of long COVID, treating those, you know, those maybe, maybe they have a cough that's affecting their sleep at night. Uh, so sometimes these things are kind of tied together um, and treating those can help with uh, sleepiness sort of indirectly. Certainly if they have other medical disorders or psychiatric disorders, you want to be sure that you're addressing those to the extent that you can as well. So going beyond sort of labeled diagnoses, other steps that you can take to try to help with their sleepiness. You know, one thing just to think about is time in a couple of senses, uh, thinking about the amount of time that they're sleeping. So if they're not sleeping enough, uh, you know, sounds very simple, but just having them sleep more. Uh, again, like I mentioned before, it, the, I think the trick a lot of times is discovering that they're not sleepy enough and that can take a detailed history sometimes um, to figure out. Uh, one warning that I would give is to be careful about patients who have insomnia. Uh, it is possible to have excessive sleepiness during the day and then insomnia at night. And uh, it's generally not advisable to tell somebody who has trouble with their sleep at night simply to sleep more. Uh, that can oftentimes lead to counterproductive behaviors. So you know, be careful about that. But in addition to just the amount of time somebody sleeps, uh, regularizing somebody's sleep schedule. So like when somebody sleeps, I think is also important. So you wanna make sure that their circadian rhythm kind of knows what to do. If you have somebody whose sleep schedule is shifting back and forth from day to day, or I should say maybe night to night, then you know effectively you have someone who's almost in a, you could almost consider it like a jet lag state constantly. Their circadian rhythm, which is supposed to help them on some level kind of know when to be sleepy and know when to be awake, will essentially get confused about that and uh, have people do the wrong things at the wrong time. So thinking about what people put in their bodies, I think is also helpful. So diet modification, so uh, alcohol would be one example of that. You wanna uh, a lot of times limit the alcohol that people are consuming. Uh, of course, it can be kind of directly sedating, but on top of that, it can affect sleep quality. And if it's affecting sleep quality, by extension, it can make people feel more sleepy. Um, and then the next point is maybe a little less evidence-based, but I still think kind of a common sense, reasonable thing to do and just kind of considering what patients are eating, timing and content of meals. Uh, I think we've all kind of experienced sort of the, uh, what you might call like a food coma kind of phenomenon. So, you know, some patients uh, may be more susceptible to this than others after a heavy meal, maybe a carbohydrate heavy meal. Uh, they might feel more sleepy afterwards. So, you know, maybe modification of how they eat, maybe smaller, more frequent meals, maybe kind of fewer carbs, something like that can, can sometimes help. Um, of course, if you have an opportunity to wean sedating medications, that's something that can help a lot. Uh, that's not always something that you can do. Obviously, patients who are prescribed those medications, you know, there's some reason at some point where, that they were prescribed those. And, you know, maybe you can't, uh, you can't change those. But if you do have the opportunity to to decrease what they take, then that can be helpful. So light can make a big difference too. Daytime light exposure can be activating. Um, and then also if you're sort of careful with how you apply light, uh, if sort of the timing is right, generally kind of in, in the morning and during the day, uh, then that can help to sort of reinforce the circadian rhythm that, that, uh, that your patient wants to have, which can be helpful. Um, something that I often say for patients uh, often recommend to patients is exercise, but this is something that I would be careful about in this population. Uh, a lot of patients with long COVID will have this kind of post-exertional malaise, so you don't necessarily want them to kind of uh, be engaging in like vigorous exercise for the purposes of, of being more awake. So that's something to, to be mindful of for this population. 
Now, thinking about when to refer patients. Now, uh, if you have somebody who you've tried all these things that I was just mentioning for, as far as evaluation management, but they're still sleepy, I think those are good patients to refer to a sleep clinic. Or, you know, if you have a specific concern for whatever reason for a specific sleep disorder, like somebody's snoring a lot and you think maybe they have sleep apnea, that would be kind of a reason, I think, to, to refer to a sleep clinic immediately as well. And so in the sleep clinic, what, what do we do if you send them to us? Uh, you know, this could be many, many talks, but just to put it all into one slide, some of the testing that we do, there's polysomnography uh, or sleep studies, in other words. Uh, so we can do this at home. We can do this in the sleep lab, which is pictured uh, it, uh, to the right here. And uh, that can look for various different things. Uh, most commonly, we'll be looking for and finding sleep apnea with uh, sleep studies. But uh, sometimes we can glean some other kind of important insight into somebody's sleep. Example, maybe we see that they kick their legs a lot in their sleep, and maybe that's disturbing their sleep and something that we can target for treatment sometimes. We do other tests too. Uh, there's something called multiple sleep latency tests, or we call them MSLTs, which is essentially a test that's done during the day where people take several naps over the course of the day. It can help us try to kind of measure sleepiness. It's not a perfect test, but sometimes in the right context can be used to maybe identify somebody who has narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia. There's also actigraphy which we don't do that often, uh, but uh, it's kind of a way to, it's a device that someone will wear around their wrist, a little bit like a watch, uh, but it's detecting movement. And the goal is to try to assess someone's sleep-wake pattern. So it does an okay or decent, pretty good in most cases job of uh, determining when somebody is asleep versus when they're awake. So what do we do to manage these uh, sleepy patients? You know, certainly if we find a specific disorder, if we find the root cause, we, we treat that. So, you know, if there's sleep apnea, we treat the sleep apnea with CPAP or whatever it might be that's appropriate for them. But sometimes we just directly treat the symptom of sleepiness, and that's usually with wake promoting agents. So, things like maybe modafinil uh, or armodafinil or things in like the stimulants in the methylphenidate family or in the amphetamine family or some kind of variation of those. I do want to make a specific mention of. Uh, a clinical trial uh, that's starting up uh, Recover Sleep, which is going to be uh, exploring the use of modafinil and uh, another medication called solvriamfetol, which are both wake promoting uh, and uh, uh, trying to see how they work for sleepy patients with long COVID. So um, that's all I've got for you. Uh, hopefully this is a helpful overview of sleepiness and long COVID. Um, thank you for your attention.